and um, he might not be a full participant for a while because of a schedule conflict. <clears throat> um, but I, I, when he can tell me somehow that, uh, no, we are, the meeting is now uh, streaming live on, on YouTube, so I see that. Okay, so uh, this is the regularly scheduled meeting of the uh, Public Safety Committee of the Town of Seabrook Island. Uh, we are meeting now on, on February 8th, uh, and uh, all members of the, of the committee, with the exception of one, uh, are, are on the, the call with us. And of course, we welcome uh, Councilman Barry Goldstein uh, to join us. Uh, <clears throat> I'll start by uh, stating that I have heard from the town clerk uh, and she assures me that we, in fact, are in compliance with any of the requirements of the Freedom of Information Act uh, for the um, state of South Carolina. So we're okay there. So I think we're ready to go. And with that, I'll turn to the agenda, <clears throat> which says we're going to start by approving the minutes from the January 11th meeting, the meeting we had last month. Uh, I have distributed those uh, minutes, uh, I think around the, the 12th or the 13th of January, uh, mm -hmm. shortly after the meeting happened. So you all have had a chance to look at that. Are there any uh, recommendations for changes or additions? Hearing none, may I have a, a motion to uh, approve these minutes? I'll make the motion to approve the meeting, Thank minutes you, of the meeting. Can I have a second? Second. Thank you. All right, with that, the minutes from January are approved. Okay. I will get those over to the town clerk and she will get them posted on the website as minutes approved. <clears throat> All right. Now we get into, if uh, we wish, the uh, kind of a discussion about what happened in the, uh, the DRC exercise from the, uh, was it the 21st of January? Yeah. <clears throat> I don't think it was the 21st. No, it was the 27th. 27th, yeah. Golly, how did I get... That's a typo on my agenda. That didn't seem right to me either. Thank you all. Sorry for the confusion on that. Um, <clears throat> writing notes. Okay. <clears throat> Uh, as, as we were starting the meeting, Ed was discussing with me uh, the idea that uh, all of this exercise was taking place within the restrictions, for lack of a better word, of being in a pandemic. So we had a whole set of, of rules, rules of engagement, if you want to call it that, uh, relative to what we could be doing and should be doing. Uh, while we're in a pandemic. These are set out on, in the emergency uh, order that uh, the mayor's put out in, uh, I think it's April or May, that we have been, we as council have been uh, updating uh, every two months uh, according to the uh, requirements of, of that ordinance. Uh, the fact that we had a virtual meeting is one of the recognitions of, of the pandemic. We didn't sit around at tables the way we, we have done in the past. Uh, <clears throat> did, Ed, did, did you have any specific concerns about the fact that we were in a pandemic and might not have covered that aspect as clearly as we should have in the exercise? Well, I just thought that as a, uh an overall statement, um, we might have said that, rem you know, reminding everyone that we are still in a pandemic and that some of our actions will have to be governed by the rules uh, of the town uh, that are so stated for actions during a pandemic. 
Um, we didn't, I read all of what uh, Scott's after action report said, and it was very good. It was all encompassing. However, in my estimation, I'm not trying to be a troublemaker. We didn't really stress the fact of this is going on during a pandemic. It wasn't even mentioned to my uh, recognition. Okay. Comments from any, anyone else? Apparently you didn't stir up enough trouble, Ed. <laughs> <laughs> I know that when we, we put the plan together, we as we even back in December, uh, we as a group, as a committee, uh, stress the fact that we wanted everyone to understand, yeah, we got this pandemic thing going on, et cetera, et cetera. That would, and who knows when we, when we get to the, uh, a real event happening that uh, we, might, we don't know if we're gonna be in a pandemic or not. But I think the, the big question is, did anything in the exercise did we propose anything during the exercise actions or restrictions or, or whatever that might have been changed if we weren't under a pandemic? And I don't, no one's been thinking about this now. So it's something I think we've got to, because this is just coming up here. And it's something we, we probably should, should think a little bit about. I can't think of anything off the top of my head that would have changed necessarily. Other, other than making mention, say, of wearing of masks and wherever possible, keeping distance, et cetera, but yet to follow through on the activities that are necessary, uh, you know, that are warranted to, um, you know, identify destruction and this and that. Uh, but, you know, to me, that mm -hmm. would then lend itself to how people act when they're carrying on the, uh, the search and stuff like that. Yeah. Okay, I've, I've got that noted and I'll see if I can get something back to the group and off to Scott and see if, uh, I don't know, it's, it's not really an action item as much as it's just something of, of a concern. Make sure that we, we are covering the fact that we are in a pandemic as we do these things or could be in a pandemic. Yeah, I, as I say, I just raised it to, to talk about because that was in our stated intention and that's it. I, you know, I'm not trying to, you know, achieve anything else. Okay, I think, I think we got that. All right. Um, let's take a look at uh, in the improvement plan, the, the, uh, the table that Scott put in there and he had 11 items that needed to be addressed. Uh, <clears throat> and we should probably discuss some of these, uh, go back, go down all of them very quickly, uh, make sure we understand what, uh, what it means, what each one means and how we intend to address them. Uh, the St. John Fire Department communications, I know that uh, Deb Lehman is going to follow through on that. And I need to, I, I will get with her, I will get with everybody on uh, target dates. So that's, that's for me to do. And then we'll be looking at this regularly as we uh, have meetings in the future to see what the status of these, each of these uh, items is. <clears throat> There's a, it talks about in, in item one, the, uh, the 800 megahertz radios and, and so forth. Um, and a little bit farther down in the comments, I believe, uh, from the uh, participants. Um, I think Scott had that section. I'm sorry, I'm scrolling through here. The, in the appendix. Participant survey com comments. Uh, there were some questions about the uh, use of our ham radio network and whether or not that would continue. And I want to come back to that a little bit later. 
So uh, I, I will get to that in a moment. Item two and item three together about communications equipment and, and radios. Um, <clears throat> the council person responsible for communications overall and as well as communications in uh, uh, <clears throat> an emergency situation is Pat Fox. So I will ask Pat to follow through on both of those items. Any questions about either one of those? I'd offer one more time under number two, uh, we have listed satellite phones. And I think we, we, we brought up, and I know I've discussed with this committee, we no longer have the satellite phone uh, subscription. It was just too expensive for the lack of benefit. You had to you had to be outside, couldn't be in a building and use a satellite phone, uh, and we only had two of them, and uh, it just it just was costing too much. There was no bang for the buck. Simple as that. Okay, item four is uh, generators, uh, and I think this was an attempt to identify property owners. Who have generators? Am I right on that? Yes. Okay. I'm going to put Joe down for that one, but I'm also going to have my name in there too. So I, I wonder how we're going to. Yeah, you know, that, that's a volunteer thing for people to say. Hey, I've got a generator. You give it. Not necessarily wanting to share that information with many people we'll have to see. Propane tanks, number five, develop a list of propane tanks on the island. Does anyone recall the genesis of this particular item? I don't. I think there was some discussion about how do you refill generators? You know, if it was a, I don't know if it was a propane tanks, but there was some issue about uh, what happens if we run out of fuel, fuel for certain things? Yeah. That was the, the genesis of that, I think. Okay. Also, the uh, danger possibility after an eighth earthquake of uh, leaking gas. Writing. Okay, uh, I don't know. Tell me something. Do you all have uh, propane service? Yes. 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 Everyone does. That's kind of what I thought that most people on the island had propane service from either Amerigas or, or I guess Berkeley. Or Blue Flame. Or, well, yeah, Blue Flame is now Amerigas. Oh, okay. <clears throat> yeah, I just got a notice from them that they're, they are no longer going to keep me on a regular schedule for Phillips because I don't use enough propane. So now I have to go out and read the, the meter myself and then call them and say, hey, I'm getting low, come out and fill me up. What a pain in the butt. <laughs> That's not going to go in the minutes. <laughs> I guess I'm going to talk about that with, with Joe. So I'm going to put down Joe and Skip again. Resident survey. This is not a new idea. Uh, in fact, I think I can recall going back uh, almost a couple of years or more. And I think I even, when John Gregg was, was the uh, chair of this committee, uh, I even put together a survey form to help us identify resources we have. 
and I'm not so sure how much what in the way of legs that form or the, the idea got after that. Um, it's kind of surprising or to me anyway, uh, that many residents are, and not just here, but anywhere, are just hesitant to bring this kind of information forward. I don't know why, uh, but but they just seem to be. So I want to I want to talk to the mayor about this one. Um, get his input on that one. Mortuary. Seeing that I am in something of a lame duck status here, I assume that I would pick up the mortuary and carry that forward. It seems to fit with that. Uh, so I'll go out and see uh, how we're going to handle the dead. You know what? I will follow up on that one. Number eight, the contractors. I need some help understanding this one too. Well, I think part of it, Skip, was, you know, if an earthquake occurs during the day, there might be contractors working on the island, building homes, et cetera, et cetera. That's it. That could be asked to help out with certain things. It would be on a volunteer basis. Yeah. I think there was even some talk about maybe not even volunteer, you know, but... Uh, yeah, well, you, know, it's good because you won't be able to get off the island, so you might as well do something for yourself. I remember that. Right. Okay, writing. Um, <clears throat> I'm going to put Joe and Skip down for that one, too. Water distribution. Some plan to distribute water from storage tanks, et cetera, et cetera. Uh, well, I'm definitely gonna have a Annie Smith Jones look at that one. In the uh, chair of the uh, utility commission. Determine options, uh, uh, number 10, emergency security options. Okay, so this, this might be kind of mapped into the um, resident survey uh, skills. I don't know if we're thinking about deputizing because people have certain skills. I certainly hope we're not making a requirement or a, a, a consideration of deputizing because they have weapons. We don't want weapons coming around around here. I don't. So it looks like another volunteer thing. Am I reading this incorrectly? Mm -hmm. Okay. I'll take that along with the mayor. Uh, <clears throat> medical evacuation, uh, number 11, uh, ask me, that's a clarification thing and Joe can do that for us. So I'll put Joe down for that one. So let's see, I need to distribute. The improvement plan. Uh, and notify assignees and get their estimate for a date. You know, one thing, uh, Skip, um, there was no representative of the marina. 
And yeah. um, th somebody said that recently sold. Uh, I understand. I, I, I think that's so. I. Uh, I'm very... wondering if uh, the new owner and, and the town have talked or whatever uh, to, um, you know, kind of tell them what we expected them relative to the Disaster Recovery Council and other things like that. I think it's a good idea to, to determine what has happened with the ownership over there. We didn't have representation from Camp St. Christopher either. Yes, um, we did. Yeah, yeah. Zach was on. Ned's not there anymore. No, um, uh, Steve. Steve Zack, do I have that name right? I think I do. Uh, Steve Zack is is has been in a few of our meetings, and he is he is the new Ned, so to speak. Uh, so he, and he was there. I, um, to be frank about the the marina. Um, <clears throat> since uh, Nick Mc, Mc, McPherson and April Goyer. I've left, I think April has left. I'm not sure, I know Nick has. The participation from the Marina in anything has been nil, nothing. Um, and again, I, I will be frank, the, the person who was supposed to do that even ran for, uh, for a town council. <clears throat> and uh, I, you know, I certainly hope that wasn't an indication of what that person was going to do if elected to town council show up once a year. I don't, I don't know. <clears throat> so it's been difficult to, uh, you know, most communications out to the marina have gone uh, without response. Um, <clears throat> I just haven't, frankly, pursued it all that much to sit down and say, what the heck's going on over there? Um, because I know they've been in a state of flux for a while. So I will follow up on that one uh, and, and see what the status is of the ownership over there and who's going to take part in this thing because we've got to do that. We have something of the same situation with the Merchants Association over there. That was, um, I can't remember his name right now, the guy that owned the ice cream store. He's building the... Uh the miniature golf course, or yeah. he was trying to. Right, right. He, um, obviously the, 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 the Merchants Association has kind of fallen apart with the absence of ongoing economy over there from, from the retailers. Uh, <clears throat> I, I think if, I don't even know what's open over there. I don't go over there. Uh, the, the, a couple of the restaurants might be open um, I don't know if any of the retail stores are open. I don't know, for example, if the ship store associated with the arena is open. So that's another uh, another hole in the, in the coverage, if you will, uh, that we need to get uh, addressed. Writing. Todd, that's who it was. Any other comments about the uh, improvement plan? And I'd ask Liz to confirm uh, what I'm what I'm thinking about what we focused on in our discussion. And food and housing came up a number of times. Um, I don't think we really spent any time talking about you know, how that 
the, those two concerns could be addressed. But if we can't get off island, and if the if uh, housing is not available, on a, then how do we deal with that? Louisa, did you understand also that we, we talked about food and housing as considerations? Okay. Yeah, we didn't, yeah. There, I don't think there was any discussion about, you know, what, what would we do if we've run out of food? And, um, and with the housing, we had talked about, uh, I think a little bit about maybe Camp St. Christopher if there aren't kids there. That there's that there are facilities there, like if there's contractors on the island, um, service people on the island that don't live on the island, we would have all those people and they would need shelter. But um, you know, Steve can could I can check with Steve and find out how how many um, m what are they called MREs meals ready to eat that we have. We have some. But I don't, I don't, I don't know how many. No, we don't have a very, we don't have an extensive supply of MREs at all. I didn't think so. We talked about water, but we really didn't talk about, you know, I wonder if anybody would have a rough idea, like just the average household, how much food, how many days worth of food people have. You know, there's another thing to consider. <clears throat> it's kind of way out, but um, Backpack Buddies, which services a couple of the schools and providing meals for the kids, uh, does store foods um, over at the Oyster Catcher building. And under you know, the circumstances of a, an earthquake, um, that may be a source um, to tap with the understanding that it could be replenished after the fact. But there is, because of uh, being involved with that to some degree, they do have food in that building. Okay. <clears throat> the comments, suggestions, ideas? You know, it, it's really a good idea to, to think about the food aspect because we've just concentrated on hurricanes so much. And, and with a hurricane, you count on most of the people being evacuated. And this is the exact opposite scenario. The island could be completely full of people and so it would be food, food would be a, you know, really important thing to think about how we would get additional food. You know, if, if we were here, like if the bridges were out for say a week. Yep. Sticking with that for a minute, does anyone have any suggestions as to how we might address that issue? What about all those uh, aggressive turkeys running around? <laughs> <laughs> there well, you go. Two, if they two, run around, two birds, if we can two put birds, pouches, of, if we can put pouches of cranberry sauce and dressing on them, then I think I'd be interested in. And again, what did I say? I don't want weapons coming around here, so. <laughs> and I'm, I'm sorry, I just finished up my it. doctor's appointment. I, I just finished up my doctor's appointment, so I'm on the, uh, at least the audio portion of the call now. Are you driving back? Yep, hitting the road right now. Okay, well, you're not going to use video then, I'm sure, so. Uh... No, hopefully not. <laughs> <laughs> Oh uh, boy, no, I don't know. I don't know, Joe. I've been giving you a lot of assignments while you've been gone. That's that's the that's the benefit of having someone that's not on, on the on the uh, on the call. Oh, let's give it to him or her. <laughs> Happens every time. 
<laughs> uh, uh, back at this idea of, of food, because I, I just have a feeling this is going to come right back to us. You know, I can go back to Scott and say, hey, you know, we didn't really cover the idea that there might not be, how are we going to replace food shortages at shelter, et cetera, et cetera. And you come right back and say, well, you're the public safety committee. Come up with ideas. What do you think? How do you, how do we want to approach that? I, you know, certainly we, we, we have to, I don't think it's a, a bad assumption that we will be in communication somehow with uh, emergency operations at at least the county level perhaps even the state level, but at least the county level. <clears throat> it's kind of, kind of why we wanted to have a, a few more 800 megahertz radios. Um, the other thing I think we can safely assume is we're not the only ones who are gonna be asking for shelter and how are we gonna get food to these people? So it still remains an issue for us to be able to say, Potentially, as, as Liz brought up, we've got contractors and other service people that have been on the island when this event occurs and have no way of, of getting to their, what they are counting on for shelter and food. In other words, they just trapped here. <clears throat> I yeah, I mean, it's not, it's, not, it's not just contractors either. I mean, during the scenario, it happened on a Wednesday morning, so like... You know, all of our staff, all of the club staff, the POA staff. Exactly. Um, you know, there's, there's a lot of people out here with basically nowhere to go. I'd be more worried, like, you know, if I can't get to where I live, I mean, I have a dog who's going to get in and take care of my dog. You know, those are kinds of things that everybody's going to be worrying about. Yeah. <clears throat> we aren't in the uh, type of community where we have to, there are some people on the island, we don't have a lot of children on the island, a lot of school age children on the island, but we have more than we have had in the past five years or so, I mean, and it's growing. So now you've got the situation of of separated families. You've got the issue of people who are working off island and can't get home, regardless of where their children or their spouses might be. It's not the, the same situation. That, that's more than just food and shelter. That's, that's, that's everything. And that was at the heart of the scenario uh, that we wanted to put together. How are we going to support <clears throat> what we have to support for potentially uh, a long period of time. <clears throat> in the emergency plan in the CEP, we have listed under response plan, uh, the, basically the, the uh, um, default response plan, which is RP1. I think we have listed the priorities the 10 or 11 priorities that we have to address, life, shelter, food, water, et cetera, et cetera, et cetera. And, it's, and they're listed. So that's what we have to kind of work with as far as a priority structure um, and where we need, to, we need to apply the resources we have. Maybe I'm not looking at this the best way but it seems to me that shelter and food are in fact resources that we have to be in a position to either provide commandeer or have a plan for. <clears throat> I don't think it's practical to ask residents, for example, to make sure they have a week's supply of food on hand. You know, I mean, <clears throat> we don't know when this thing is going to hit, if it's ever going to hit. With a hurricane, there's always that, you know, two week notice, one week notice, go out and get all the batteries you can, get out and get all the, the bottled water you can, and, and people have a, an opportunity to address personal needs in enough time, usually. 
if they take the time to store up and have that stuff on hand. Not so with a hurricane. So I don't think it's practical to, to have something like that in a plan that says, make sure you have enough food on hand. Am I off base on that? Um, you pretty much every year, um, even when there's not an impending hurricane and they start, they kick off hurricane season, they suggest that people have um, uh, at least a week's worth of, of canned food on hand. And they do that before there's any eminent um, listed hurricanes. They do that pretty much every June at the beginning of hurricane season. So is, maybe it's not a stupid <laughs> idea just uh, that people should always have a, you know, you live on an island, you should always have at least a week's worth of, of uh, canned foods. I don't know. Writing. <clears throat> well, we, we, we certainly have a, a checklist that we send out usually, as, as Liz said, in, in June or in May to get people ready for a hurricane season as it approaches. There's also an item in the, in the CEP, uh, again, in response plan one, uh, under OPCON 3, or normal operations, uh, that <clears throat> is a checklist of what people should be doing it's mostly within the, uh, the DRC or, or council or people directly associated with emergency planning. Uh, by April 15th, do we have sufficient batteries? Have we checked to make sure all of our radios are working? And that, that's a good checklist to go through. Uh, we don't usually uh, involve the public, if you will, in, in that exercise. And I'm not so sure we need to, other than just a reminder, you know, do the same thing at your home. Do you have battery operated radio, for example? Does it work? Uh, what does it listen to? AM, FM? Do you have citizen band? Do you have whatever? Um, and that might be the, and, and, and as Liz said, we probably stress the idea of having sufficient food, water, so forth on, on hand. Shelter is not usually an issue. Uh, because most people, if they're smart, have evacuated. Uh, and uh, particularly if, if the storm threat appears to be pretty significant. We only have a few brave, uh, rather uh, not so smart souls that like to spend their time on the island during those things. So. What else might be... I, I know I'm going back in my head to times when I've had these discussions with Rob Saban in, in past years when he was on the committee about MREs. <clears throat> we can have MREs. I don't think we should be thinking about MREs vis-a-vis -vis the community. That's just, that's just too much. <clears throat> But I think having enough MREs, uh, Joe, for example, for looking at staff requirements, uh, your people here, uh, and I would suggest the same for POA, their staff requirements. These are people that, that who reside off island that, as we suggested, might be trapped on here. <clears throat> and we probably should look into the idea of sufficient MREs or other approaches for having at least a week's worth of, of meals for them. Yeah, we, we do we do have a stockpile at Town Hall. I mean, how long it lasts is dependent on, is it, you know, just the staff? Is it all of council staff? I mean, you know, who all's using it? But um, we actually last year budgeted and replaced because um, the ones we had were coming up on their uh, expiration. So um, uh, I, I know we have at least a couple hundred um 
I finally, when we tossed the old ones, we're like, has anyone ever tried one of these before just to see what it actually tastes like? And they were absolutely <laughs> disgusting. So <clears throat> desperate times call for desperate measures. But um, we, we did get some new ones, and we do have a stash at Town Hall. Well, I know under any circumstances, I, I would pass on the okra stew and the, and the peas and mushrooms. Uh, somebody else can have that. I'll, 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 I'll live on the noodles and rice. That's big of you. <laughs> <laughs> I've, never, I've never even looked to see what some of the MREs offer. Um, but, you know, Joe, Joe said it right. Desperate times, desperate. Are you telling me, Skip, that if you haven't had any food in a week that you're going to pass on the piece of mushrooms? Probably not. Well, the, the ones that we have, I know some, they're like you add water. Um, the ones that we have are dry um, because, you know, we may or may not have access to water for some period. So, I mean... They're basically just like bar type things. And um, so, I mean, it's basically just like, a, well, we haven't tried the new ones because we're saving those in the event of an emergency. But the ones that we had were kind of like almost like a, just like a dry wafer. Um, very weird texture, weird taste. But I mean, if you're starving, you're going to eat it. Yep. <laughs> Okay, well, you are, Joe, you are apparently managing that part, so. And as I say, I think. Um, I want to ask Heather at uh, POA what she has in mind, because uh, you and Joe and Heather might be able to coordinate resources on that if there's a possibility of doing so. I guess we should include club to club. There are a lot of uh, club employees who could be trapped down here. Am I correct? Yeah. Yeah. Let me, any more on, on any that? More? <laughs> okay. Um, I said I wanted to come back to ham radios. <clears throat> Let's, as I went through, read through the, uh, <clears throat> the participant survey comments at the end of Scott's report, there were some questions about whether or not the uh, community, well, not the community, I guess the, the emergency management structure is still going to be dedicated to ham radios, or are we all going to try and, and go over to 800 megahertz radios? <clears throat> I think that was a misunderstanding uh, during the, the exercise. There was certainly talk about using 800 megahertz radios and expanding our use of 800 megahertz radios, but I don't think any of that was meant to the exclusion of ham radio. And I can say the ham radio is still going to be considered the backbone communication structure for the island. Uh, did anyone pick up anything different from, than that? Okay. One of the things that Scott in the past has stressed during these exercises is a concept he refers to as battle rhythm. And I don't know how many of you are, are remember what he says about that, but that's essentially making sure we, we're in, what happened here? Yeah, there we go. That we're in uh, some kind of flow uh, that is, you know, we know what we're doing, Communication link goes from one hand to the other hand. The uh, 
the, the ideas are flowing, the recommendations are flowing. We have making sure that we've got the right resources to the right response points, et cetera, et cetera. And the battle rhythm is that, you know, we anticipate that a meeting's coming up. We anticipate after that, that there's a, a public information uh, notification. We anticipate after that, and we've got all these things going. Did anyone get a sense from the exercise that we had a battle rhythm going? I think under the circumstances of COVID, uh, where you're fragmented as we were, uh, we did have somewhat of a rhythm, but it's hard when you're isolated like we were to, it's just like, you know, a, a sporting event when you have cardboard up, uh, it's not the same as having fans. So, you know, there's, there's something that is derived a pulse a beat of people working together and you know in harmony and everything i think harmony gets lost sometimes in zoom type meetings other comments well we, we didn't we didn't really get to uh, a basic routine um, we talked, we divided up into groups and talked about like what communications would like to say, what should be said, what, what could be said, but we didn't say, well, I guess we did kind of say like day one, we would have to say this and then day, and then day two, we would say that, but we didn't really set up a routine that there will be X amount of meetings and then, and the mayor will then delegate these responsibilities and then those people will, you know, we didn't go into a day-to-day -day routine. Is that what you're asking by battle rhythm? Uh, yes. And uh, my, my true confession, this was my comment. And I don't think the exercise was designed to even try to get into a battle rhythm. Um, we seem to be concentrating more on, on understanding activities and resources, but not necessarily a flow of how we were handling things. And if I were to go back and, and restructure the exercise, I think I would try and get some of that in there. So I, 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 wanted, I just wanted to test, was I the only one who was concerned that we hadn't had the opportunity to try and set that up? Now I go back to, to Ed's idea of the pandemic and how much did the pandemic, does a pandemic uh, situation uh, hinder uh, that kind of flow? And I would say that personally, I'm very encouraged by how the um, virtual meeting technology, how well it worked. And that in fact, if, if we do have that capability during an event like an earthquake, if we're able to restore that level of communication uh, soon enough, I think that is a very effective way to do things. Um, <clears throat> in our group, uh, which included, uh, uh, let's see, I think it was John and me, and I can't remember who else was in there. Uh, <clears throat> we were talking about trying to be able to get people to physically meet um, at a, where do you where do you set up a miok? And do you set up a physical miok as opposed to just a virtual miok? And well, town hall might be a little bit compromised. We don't know if we can go in there and actually use it. Uh, so what are some of the other alternative sites that we could use to establish a, a, a physical uh, MIOC? Uh, and we did in that one, Ed, uh, say that we would have to be able to accommodate the fact that we were in a pandemic. There would have to be enough room to uh, confirm and establish social distancing. It couldn't be a small place where 10 people are trying to get together. Uh, if there's that many, then it would have to be bigger, possibly even outside. Uh, we, you know, so we, 
they did cover that aspect of it. But that was as far as we got in, a, in, a, in an actual activity flow uh, of seeing what happens when these people responsible for this let that group know and that group has certain activities that they take as a result and they let others know, others know, et cetera, et cetera. And that's the flow I was hoping to see. Um, and I, I, I just don't think we designed that enough into the scenario itself. That's the whole FEMA approach. That's what FEMA is, is, is the whole um, flow charts. And there's the, you start out in, with the incident commander, and then he sets up his staff of, um, of five people. And each one of those has a different function. And then under those people, then they recruit other people and everybody has specific tasks. And then um, it, it, it's, it's a top down and uh, bottom up approach. And it's so you don't uh, duplicate services. And it's so that uh, the people that are helping are safe and everybody's accounted for, that's the whole FEMA, at, which was they really fine-tuned and developed after Katrina and um, Hurricane Sandy. I know they, they even uh, have suggestions for uh, phone trees. Uh, who calls whom? Oh, that person's not there, then this person does. Or you're not available to call, then this person makes the call, et cetera. And you know, to keep that communication moving, as you said, that's a top-down aspect. Make sure it's getting down to the to the ground level, so to speak. Yeah, that's good. Um, other comments, suggestions? All right, the last item I had under that one was, and we kind of talked about this, the level of participation that we got from uh, Marina, uh, Camp St. Christopher, uh, and uh, St. John's Fire Department. I, I think the only one that concerns me out of that is, as I dwelled on a few minutes ago, uh, Marina. And it's not just the, the boat operations, it's the retail operations, everything over there. We need to get more of a coordinated effort and um, looking at my notes, that's something that's Skip, I, yes. Skip, I believe I believe the marina had a closing last week, or they were scheduled to have a closing last week. Uh, the marina is about to go under new ownership, so I think it'll be important to uh, establish that relationship with the new ownership group and. Um, you know, try to bring them into the fold and maybe get a little bit better participation. Yeah, I, we had discussed this earlier in the meeting, Joe, that we weren't really sure what the uh, status was of ownership at the marina. And, uh, you know, the rumor mill is pretty good. And it seemed as though it was pretty accurate in this case. So you're right. After the closing, we need to sit down, need to get, a, I guess, a delegation of town people uh, sit down and, and go over some of the things, you know, that uh, we would like them to help and participate. Uh, Joe, the ownership will include the retail space as well as the marina space. Do you, do you know that it's a, a full purchase of the property or just the marina operations? Uh, my understanding is it's the entire property. Okay. Right. And I say that because I did a, um, a zoning letter for them prior to the uh, scheduled closing and it did include all of the uh, parcels at the marina. Okay, because one of the other things we talked about was that we, we lost uh, uh, kind of a uh, go-to point for the uh, retailers. And I guess we have a pretty good list of the retailers, but we don't know how many of them are still in operation. 
how many of them will be in operation once the, we get through this pandemic. Yeah, I think there are, the new group has a lot of plans over there and those, you know, we'll have to see play out. But um, uh, I know the one, the one who seems to be most engaged over there right now is the, uh, the salty dog. Um, so I don't know if anyone has a good relationship with them at all, but, um, you know, I, I think if we could, you know, get them involved somehow, um, you know, that might help open some doors over there. Okay, let's, uh, and as we said, once we find out, once the closing has happened, then I think we should get a delegation together and sit down with the... Uh, new yeah, it was... Uh, I believe it was scheduled for last Monday, but I, I haven't confirmed that it took place or not. Can you do that? Yeah, I can check it out. And uh, just from, uh, and I've been talking with that group for several months and um, just from a public safety standpoint, one of the things they did express to me was one of their top priorities was shoring up the uh, safety on the um, uh, the boardwalk out there. Uh, you know, we've had a lot of uh, issues um, yeah. between them and the neighbors, and um, that that is high on their list is to uh, address some of the safety concerns out there. Well, you and I have been going around with that issue for what, almost six years now? Definitely the entire time I've been here, which is a little over three. For those of you who might not know, this has been an issue with the, uh, uh, the, uh, the townhouses that are over there that about the boardwalk area and their property goes right up to the boardwalk area and essentially sinkholes have been occurring uh, on the property a um, number of reasons and a lot of finger pointing. Well, it's the marina's fault. No, it's the, it's the townhouse association fault. It's uh, this, that, and the other. It's just something that's been going on for a while. Uh, safety hazard and we'll see what happens. A lot of it has to do with, frankly, the flow of the river in there. That if you've ever been over there uh, in a tide and seen how quickly that that current moves as the tide changes, uh, it's it's really quite something to see. And it's a way of just eroding underneath some of the boardwalk area, taking out dirt and fill and whatever that's gone in there. It's going to be a tough row for them to go, but uh, let's see what happens. All right, uh, is there anything else that people would like to discuss, cover, or in any other way talk about the DRC exercise? All right, if that's the case, hearing Nothing. I think we can move on to the next item on the agenda. And this is a, a result of, of a comment that came into uh, the town website. Um, and I think I've distributed that to everybody on the committee. And <clears throat> I wanted to to talk about because the mayor has kind of put this in, in our bailiwick appropriately. The POA has a leash law, which covers obviously everything within, within the gate, whether it covers 
their properties or their residents that are not inside the gate, like the marina, or like the ones over Salt Marsh and some of the ones over there. It's uncertain in my mind, but not, not necessarily important. The town leash law requirements, we have none except for what we established in the beach laws, the beach ordinance that we updated um, almost two years ago. So the town does not have anything regulating, for example, dogs that would be on the path from town hall to fresh fields. The question is, I think, do we need to consider having a leash law that covers all of the town property and not, and, and, and not just the beach? Comments? So the marina then doesn't have a leash law because it's outside of the gate? I'm not aware they do. And if it became a town law, then it would, we would just be adding um, the area, the Seabrook Island area outside of the gate, including the marina and the walkway and, and like that parking lot over there by McCann's and uh, the real estate office that area and back in there, that's all that would be added then, right? Uh, that, that, that is correct. Uh, well, question, Joe, wouldn't if we do a town leash law, it would cover the entire town, including including Sapoa property? I mean, Sapoa could have more restrictive, but they couldn't have less restrictive. That was my question. Yeah. So we wouldn't be adding that much. If Yeah, um, I mean, it depends on how you do it. Um, you would most likely just have a, you know, a town-wide leash ordinance. Um, I think the concern with having something town-wide is if the POA decides, hey, you know, the town has something, so we're not uh, going to actively enforce ours, then it's kind of putting us in the mix and creating the expectation that the town will enforce, um, you know, this ordinance town-wide. Um, but I, I know a couple of you have said the POA has a leash law. The POA doesn't have the authority to create laws. They have a leash rule, um, yeah. which is going to be different. But, um, yeah, I, I don't know that the Marina uh, Owners Association has anything or not. But, um, yeah, like, like Skip said, the only place where we regulate uh, animals being on leashes is on the beach. Um, you know, so if you wanted to have something just like for the pathways or something and just target it there, that would be one thing. But if we're going to do it, you know, town wide, that's a bit more of a, I mean, it's easy to do in the ordinance, but as far as creating an expectation of enforcement, you know, we only have part-time code enforcement officers. So, um, just something to keep in mind. Um, earlier in, uh, well, say late last year, not earlier in the year, we talked about the safety on that path. The thing with bicycles and walkers, also when there are turns and vision is blocked and everything. I think if people are allowed to walk dogs off leash, we're introducing something that exists now that can create more safety problems. Because if a dog uh, sees a bicycle come and he starts running and uh, at the bike because he's playful and the person falls, I just think that, you know, it's a safety issue more than anything else. And if the town is responsible for the walk, we got to think safety as primary.
having a leash law doesn't preclude the fact that someone's going to could potentially get injured from a dog. True. Uh, I mean, the dog could still be on a leash, number one, but number two, if the dog isn't on a leash, then, then I mean, there's just some, uh, just a higher level of liability, I would think if, and I'm not a lawyer, uh, if uh, an attack did occur and they were in town property and the dog was on a leash. So SEPOA enforces the leash rule um, in a reactive way, right? Like, it, it, because people know that there's a rule so that then, because I, I, part of the, part of what we read was that, so, that people are fined and that's how they enforce it, right? It's like a reactive thing that if somebody's dog isn't on a leash and it attacks somebody else's dog, then that owner is fined so with the town thing, it wouldn't, it, it wouldn't, it would just be more of a reactive rule that then, you know, if you uh, break the rule and your dog isn't on a leash and it injures somebody else's dog, then, then you, you're fine. Or somebody else complains and then you're fined. Is that how it would work? How does the SEPOA uh, enforce their leash law. I know it's real strict on the beaches, you know, and they drive the trucks up and down and they stop you and fine you, but just on the general island, is, it just, is it just on the beaches, that's us, our beach patrol, right? I, I, I think you're right. It's, it's uh, uh, Liz, it's, it's, a, it's a reactive thing. It's almost like the, the mask ordinance in the city of Charleston. Uh, you're supposed to be wearing a mask. Well, if you're not wearing a mask and somebody sees you and reports you, and they can, you, you can be, you can be issued a ticket. Um, the fine is intended to be part of the deterrent, part of the compliance factor that goes with uh, having a rule in place. I thought there was an incident involving, or multiple incidents involving uh, one dog owner where uh, it went beyond the fine. I'm not exactly positive, but I do know a former resident um, was, uh, he and his dog were attacked and the dog was hurt and he was knocked over and everything. And I think you know, it's only hearsay, but the, the person was, you know, kind of forbidden to walk his dogs uh, in the area. There have been a, a, a couple of incidents or, or more up with, uh, as you have described it, or similar as you have described it in. Uh, I don't know the particular, I only know the particulars on one that happened on the beach. Uh, where a dog enthusiastically uh, jumped on, on someone that was actually with the dog owner and knocked the person down. And um, he, you know, had to get some medical treatment. But No, yeah. this was Dick, Dick Hughes. Who yeah, I know the one. Yeah. yeah. And it, it was a rather, I, I recall it a rather vicious uh, incident. So uh, if we put a leash, if we recommend or you know, as a committee, yeah, we think the town should have a, a leash ordinance that, that is town-wide. Um, that ordinance, should that ordinance include a fine for non-compliance? Absolutely. Yes. Probably so you're get people to people to, to follow the rule. I mean, I know Joe's response to a lot of things that the town has is we have no way to enforce this, but that response is not the best response to most things. Our answer is we put an ordinance in place and we expect people to comply. And this whole issue has come about because the lady that sent the email, the people that 
had some problems, have moved over to Mohicketts, I believe, and now they have their dog over there. And so there's no ordinance covering her over there. So, I mean, I think it's only proper for the town to have a leash law. And like Joe said, I suppose if the POA chooses not to enforce theirs and rely on us, then we'll have to deal with that in the future. But um, I do think the town has the obligation to have a leash law that covers the entire town. I would agree with that. I mean, it's fairly simple. It's not a complicated issue. The, the, we have holes in the POA covers a certain area, but we have holes in the other portions. But most responsible towns have a leash law, and hopefully our leash law will mirror that of SEPOA's, and therefore SEPOA can then keep doing what they're doing and don't abdicate their responsibility so that people have some immediate recourse by calling SEPOA but if they do break the law, besides getting an unhappy letter from Sapoa or having to go through what I think they tried before, which is calling Charleston County and getting the county involved, they could come to the town. The town can issue what we do, which is it would be a misdemeanor and a fine. I mean, that's the only, only recourse the town has, which is a fairly substantial response. But that's the way it should be handled. Oh boy, come up with that word misdemeanor again, holy cow. And well, we it, have no other option. That's the only option that the town has. I, 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 yeah, you're absolutely right. Yeah, just with all the discussion on the, on the short-term rental thing, good I golly, know. that is just, you know, wow. Um, people don't seem to understand. If, if you're caught speeding out on, on the interstate and you're issued a ticket, that could be a misdemeanor particularly if you don't show up for your court date, if you have a court date, or you decide not to pay the fine. Now you're in a completely different category of misdemeanor. But anyway, again, I'm not, a, I'm not a lawyer. Anybody else with comments? Art, I think you were in favor of that. Yes. Liz, are you in favor of a leash law? Yeah, absolutely. Having pets is, has a responsibility with it, and, and, and no one has the right to uh, infringe on other people's safety. Ed, you're in favor of that? Yes, sir. And, and I don't think that it's going to be, you know, I don't see it very often. So I don't think it'll be that big a deal. I don't, but to, you know, to keep people safe, I think it's a good idea. Okay, I will make that recommendation. This will be an op a topic of discussion, I believe, at tomorrow's Ways and Means meeting. Um, so I will make sure that I say that as a committee, we are saying, yes, we think the town should do that. And I'm sure that'll end up in, in Joe's lap to create the, uh, uh, the ordinance that the committee can then uh, review and, and decide to approve and adopt. Okay, uh, next item on the agenda. Uh, and, and Joe, I don't know if you're in position to do this. You usually cover a few items that, that you have. Uh, do you have any things you want to keep us abreast of or uh, inform us about? Uh, I would just say we've um, put out a, a invitation for bids for the um, Beach Patrol contract. Um, last year was the um, final year of our uh, three-year um, term with uh, Island Beach Services. So we did uh, did put out a new, <coughs> excuse me, request for bids. Um, those are due this Friday, and um, we expect to sign a new contract uh, sometime likely by mid-March and our new beach patrol season will start in uh, April. Uh, really the only significant change this time around is um, uh, the term of the contract. Pretty much everything else is uh, by and large about the same as what we had uh, last year, which is the beach patrol season running from April through uh, September. 
Um, but for this one, we're looking at doing a, an initial term of two years with three one-year renewals. So it would be a, a total of up to five years, whereas the last one was a one year with two one-year renewals for a total of three years. So um, that's really the only significant change this time around. Um, I, I have been in contact and spoken with our uh, current provider. I <clears throat> do expect them to submit uh, another bid, but we have advertised it uh, in the newspaper and on the, uh, uh, the statewide uh, it's a website called Skibo. Um, South Carolina Business Opportunities. It's what you know. All the cities, counties, state agencies, school districts, universities use for uh, advertising uh, requests for bids and proposals. So um, we'll get those by. I think it's two o'clock on Friday, and uh, I expect to have a, an update at our next council meeting um, towards the end of February. And that's it. Okay. <laughs> Comments, questions for Joe? I have a, I have, a, oh, go ahead. I'm sorry. No, go ahead. No, that, uh, you have other items. I just uh, wanted to say something after you were done. Okay. Actually, I'm moving down to miscellaneous business and kind of an open item here. Does anyone have anything we haven't talked about that we probably should have talked about today? Um, just an observation, Skip. Um, as you drive in Seabrook Island Road and you come to the point where the crosswalk is and the 15 mile an hour uh, speeding sign is, the yellow sign that is used to show the crosswalk kind of blocks visibility of the 15 mile an hour change. And then there's a little tree there or whatever. So if that sign could be moved over a little, the 15 mile an hour sign would be much more visible. It's just a suggestion. This is uh, right outside town We're hall. Actually Yes, it's it's the uh, right outside the gate, you know, just where uh, you approach the uh, the gateway. Joe? Yeah, council actually approved last year and we're working with um, a contractor right now to um, redo all the signage on Seabrook Island Road. Right now where the 15 mile an hour zone starts, that's on POA property, so we don't it's not our sign. We can't really dictate where it goes. Um, but council last year did approve um, where the 15 mile an hour, a relocation of where the 15 mile an hour zone will begin. Um, right now, it basically starts at the crosswalk. And based on what council approved, it's going to move uh, a few hundred feet down the road going towards the traffic circle. So the intent of that was to get people to slow down as they're approaching the crosswalk, not while they're in the crosswalk. And I think that will help address that concern as soon as we get that up. Sounds good. Okay, any other business? All right, then. I guess make sure we all know our next meeting is March 8th, regularly scheduled time. So if there's nothing else, then I'll entertain a motion to adjourn. You want to keep meeting? <laughs> I'll make the motion to adjourn the meeting. We have a second. I'll Thank second. you, Liz. Okay, we are adjourned. Thanks everybody. Um, uh, make sure if you haven't already, I'll put in a plug for the POA that you have voted. Uh, we need to make sure that we get everybody eligible to vote to vote. Uh, so make sure you get that one in. And I think that the meeting will be a virtual meeting. 
Um, so if you want to be a part of that, I think that there is a link that you can use to uh, uh, tell them you want to be a part of the virtual 